another segment of Treeline Pursuits video cast. Today, um, we're going to talk backcountry meal preparation. Particularly, we're going to talk about the components that I use and the methods and the techniques and the packaging that I use to prepare meals and take them into the backcountry. Um, about two years ago, um, I moved to Montana. And I got the opportunity to start spending dozens and dozens and dozens of days in the backcountry, hunting, fishing, camping, um, primarily hunting. And in those pursuits, I was eating a lot of dehydrated meals, particularly Mountain House and some other ones. And just the quality of the meals, the taste of the meals, the sodium in those meals, the Mountain House particularly had some, all kinds of ill effects. Um, and especially when you're eating the quantity that I was, that I was eating. So I decided that it was about time that, that I took the leap and kind of, um, figured out how to make my own dehydrated backcountry meals. You know, ultimately as an end result, I found out that it was a lot easier than I thought it was going to be. Um, I made a few mistakes and hopefully this video will help you keep from making some of those mistakes. And I figured some things out that have made that has made the task much easier. So hopefully that will, will help you too. So this video is really for those of you that may already be dehydrating your own meals. Maybe you're looking for a way to kind of expand kind of what you're doing and maybe some tips and techniques that I use. Um, and secondly, this video is for those that are considering uh, breaking away from that prepackaged, um, freeze dried or dehydrated meals that you buy upwards of $18 a meal um, and you take control of that process and you start doing your own. So maybe um, maybe this video can serve both of those communities. So um, let's just dive in and let's get started. So first of all, let's talk dehydrators. That's the core of it. That's where it all gets started. This is not a video to rank dehydrators or to recommend the best dehydrators or to evaluate dehydrators. Um, there are a lot of great dehydrators. That's not true. There are not a lot of great dehydrators. There are some great dehydrators. I think that personally, I think that the Excalibur is a great unit. Um, I haven't used that unit, but a lot of friends that I know, I know Ryan Lampers with Hunt Harvest Health podcast. If you're not listening to his podcast, you should. I've got a lot of my influence and a lot of my motivation from Hillary and Ryan, uh, and they do great work. And I do believe they use an Excalibur. And I have several other people and friends, acquaintances I've met that use that, that dehydrator. I think it's a fantastic one. Um, but when I started, I kind of looked at a couple of you know options, and it's a significant investment if you're going to get a decent um, dehydrator. So I chose to go with the Cabela's, 80 liter commercial they have 120 I, I i mean i don't know uh anybody that would really benefit from 120 um i can do in this unit i can do about 10 to 12 meals per cycle meaning you know once the trays are full edge to edge um then um i can get somewhere between 10 and 12 meals per you know running cycle which is plenty that's as much as my wife wants to cook for me at one time. So when you're looking at dehydrators, there's a couple of things you want to make sure that you're evaluating, rather no matter what you get. It's got to have a really robust fan and a really high quality air circulation. Um, those are this critical. The second one is temperature control. Um, you know, it needs to go somewhere between 100 and let's call it 100 to 165. Um, you're going to do meats, raw meats, like jerky, things like that, towards the upper limit of that 165. I do most of my meal prep between 130 uh, and 135. Now, that's pre-cooked meals that have already been cooked, and then they go into the dehydrator. I, do, I, I dehydrate those for about 100, dehydrate those at about 130 to 135. Usually, my meals are averaging about 12 to 14 hours. Um, I want them very dry. Now, a lot of people can get by with less than that. Um, I just don't like to take chances with moisture in those meals. And so I like to go to a little more extreme with that. 
and I find that they rehydrate um, fantastic. So back to the idea, you need a fan and you need a good circulation um, system in there. You've got to have good temperature control and temperature adjustability, in my opinion. The next thing you're going to want to make sure it has is a timer. Um, you know, some of this stuff is pretty delicate and you want to be able to put it on when you go to bed and, and not have to remember to get down there and turn it off and et cetera, et cetera. So those are the things you kind of want to make sure it has um, first and foremost. I will advise you, um, you know, it's like, it's like the old adage, you know, cheap is cheap. And, you know, this unit, I think you can get this unit on sale most times for under $250. Um, I know that's a lot of money, but when you, I was spending somewhere between fifteen to $1,800 just on Mountain House. So for me, it was a no brainer. Um, but I'll leave that to you for your individual budget. So this particular unit has all those features I talked about. Uh, it has a smart technology they call, I'm not sure, you know, everybody has their proprietary stuff. Basically it warms up the outer, um, the casing before it starts um, dehydrating. It, it, it's very consistent temperature. So however it does that, that consistent temperature is critical. The environment that you have your dehydrator setting in can affect it if it's really cold or really warm. Um, so um, I have mine down in my meat processing room. I'm where we're at now. I'm lucky that we have that. Some people do not. This is probably not the best kitchen top unit. It does make some noise, not a great deal amount. I've heard a lot louder, but it is pretty good size. You can tell. Um, so fitting on the counter in a kitchen, your wife may or may not, or husband may or may not appreciate that, or they may. Um, so what I really like about this one is I love the front door loading. It's just, you know, like refrigerator style door. You've got your door, it's got the seals, of course, it's got, it's got 12 trays. What I particularly like about these trays is that it's wire grid, wire mesh. This makes these trays in this particular unit highly functional. Um, and I'm gonna talk briefly about that. I'm gonna move this, this vacuum sealer a little bit. So let's talk trays, because this is really, I think, what separates um, this dehydrator and from some of the others. The wire mesh trays are fantastic for a lot of reasons. Most of the time, if I'm doing meals, um, I'm doing one of two methods. Number one, I'm using the tray, of course, and then on the tray, I'm either putting, um, let me grab, I'm putting down um, parchment paper. I'm just getting a sheet of parchment paper. Parchment paper is the dehydrator's, um, it's just gold in the dehydrating world. I lay it right on the tray, and you can see that when that's on the tray, it just lays there, just no problem. I put my meal, let's say I'm making, like I just made here, uh, bear chili. I made bear chili mac yesterday. So I put on about, about two cups, two big cups of bear chili mac in the center of this parchment paper. I take a second piece of parchment paper, put it on top of that, and that's what allows me to spread it out. One of the keys with dehydrating is you're gonna want consistency with how finely, how fine you chop up stuff, and particularly how fine it is distributed on the trays. Not how fine, how consistent. I like it very thin, very uniform, edge to edge. It's real difficult to get with a spoon, a spatula. So I found that the other piece of parchment paper and using your hands and spreading it out virtually as thin as you can get it, or even using a rolling pin, the hands work great. I don't wanna get into too many dehydrating tips. Um, I'm gonna talk about that in other videos, and I have another video up already with some of that. I really wanna talk equipment, but in order to talk equipment, we have to cover a few things I think are really important. And these trays um, in particular. So I use the parchment paper on the trays. If I'm dehydrating something like a soup or something that's got a real liquid consistency. Now, for the most part, I try to cook most of my meals with um, kind of reduce the liquid amount, so to speak. But a lot of cases I get where it's real soupy or real runny. 
So what I'll do is just real low, um, like a baking pan, just real cheap baking pans. And again, I line those baking pans with parchment paper. I put those on top of the trays. And then I put them in the dehydrator. One of the other great things I like about the Cabela's dehydrator is the trays can be staggered. Like I can skip a couple of trays. If I need more room for something, I can add in, I can put all, it holds 12 trays. So I can mix and match the trays if I need height to accommodate a baking uh, tray or, or whatever the case may be. When you're using the parchment paper and using it, you just want to make sure you you don't clog it up too much where the air, meaning clog up, meaning have too much extra paper in there to limit your airflow in your dehydrator. So that basically covers that. The trays in, in on this unit, I really like the versatility um, of these trays. Um, and again, it's real simple as far as um, dials. I mean, you push the dial, you turn it to 135. We, we do it to 135, push it once, it goes to the timer, set it to 14 hours, you push it again, you set the minutes, you push it again, it starts. That simple. Um, even I can use it. So you can hear the fan already starting to warm. We'll turn that off for now. Um, so that is about it for the dehydrator. I think that there's a lot of things that can be said about it. Um, and other dehydrators. But again, I kind of want to cover the components. Again, parchment paper, non-stick parchment paper um, is, is, a, is a real, real valuable tool in the dehydrating. Okay, so next up is a vacuum sealer. Now, this is a, this is a, um, a tool that you do not have to have. Um, I started out with with just an impact vacuum sealer, really simple, 90, 80, $90 unit. It actually sealed the Mylar just fine um, and it still would work just fine. I don't vacuum seal most of my meals. Um, for, you know, I don't know why I don't necessarily, I just, I don't think there's really a need to and I'll explain that a little bit further. But so you can get by with a lesser quality vacuum sealer. I have an accompanying video coming out about processing your own meat. Um, and so in the process of doing my own meat, I, I really do like using a vacuum sealer um, for meat. So I upgraded my vacuum sealer from just this cheap $0, $80, $90, maybe even cheaper vacuum sealer. Um, I'm now using uh, this Cabela's. It is a 12. It's a Cabela's commercial 12 inch, um, and, it, and, it, and it's a nice unit. Um, it does a lot of things that you may or may not need. Again, it's a fairly pricey unit, virtually the same price as the dehydrator. But the combination of these two allow me to do a lot of my own meat. Um, and as well as my backcountry meals. So the investment for me was worth it. Um, so the, the key thing on the sealers is, like I said, you don't really have to have it, but if you're gonna use the Mylar bags and, and put your dehydrated meals in the bags that we're gonna talk about next, you have to have a way to seal those bags. And so you're gonna to have to have some type of sealer. The sealer needs to get to about 400 degrees um, on the on the little sealing strip in order to seal this mylar most of the specs and all the mylar bags that that I've seen is around the 400 degree mark the two that I use both are the same 400 degrees uh, even the thicker one uh, will seal nicely um, with that temperature so vacuum sealers we don't need to spend a lot of time on it um, I'm gonna have a full description with links to the two units descriptions of the two units uh, and perhaps a few more details um, on the units um, on, an account, uh, on a blog post that will be following this video on my website at treelinepursuits.com. So again, vacuum sealers, just about any vacuum sealer will do as long as it can get to the temperature necessary for the Mylar. Okay, so next up, 
and probably what I've gotten the most questions is about is the packaging. Everyone's pretty much understands they've got to dehydrate their meals. Um, maybe the vacuum sealer is kind of a new thing with dehydrating, but the bags that you're putting them in to eat, to be able to eat those meals in the background without using plates and um, bowls and stuff. Um, that was the kind of the, the, the tough part for me in the beginning was finding that bag. So when I went to look for bags, I was looking for bags that did a couple of things. Um, one, I was looking for a bag that was big enough to accommodate a large meal, at least mountain house size, if not maybe a tiny bit bigger. I'm a big guy. Once in a while when I'm eating my mountain house, when I finish, when I was eating my mountain house, I would finish and I'd be like, I wish I had just a little bit more. Or... I would be like, this is quite a bit. I might eat some more a little bit later and I want to be able to zip, zip it up. So secondly, I wanted my bags to have the zipper very similar to the Mountain House. Honestly, I wanted my packaging to be very similar to Mountain House because I really liked um, the Mountain House packaging much more than the product. So I wanted the, um, the bag that could accommodate that. I wanted the Ziploc and I wanted space above the Ziploc so that it could be sealed with a vacuum sealer so those were some of the some of the things that i was looking for when i set out to find the perfect bag um and i have since found the perfect bag about a year ago i found a company it's called sorbent systems and i spell it it's s-o-r-b-e-n-t-s systems.com um the website is ridiculously um complicated meaning it is filled with products. They have so many storage systems and packaging systems and, and all kinds of things. So you can get really lost trying to find the bag. So in the description on this video, I'm gonna post links and product numbers um, and everything so that you can, you can get to exactly the bags I'm talking about without, without finding it. One of the things about the Zorbin systems you're gonna find is they're kind of a, a large distributor. So the minimum quantities you can buy in is 50, and for some of them it's 250. That may be a problem for some, but for me that's that easily fits my needs. I think it's well worth it. Um, we'll talk particulars when we get to them. Okay. So um, some products I get from Zorbasis. So the first bag I get is. Um, this is an eight and a half by 8.75 bag. This is a Mylar 4.5 milliliter bag. This particular bag has jambalaya in it. Um, you can see that it has a zipper. Um, and you can see that the product, there's two cups of jambalaya in here, is about half of the bag. That allows plenty of room to open it up and rehydrate this with boiling water. So um, the process with these bags is very similar to Mountain House in the field. It's got a tear notch at the top. You're going to tear the notch just like a Mountain House, it tears, and then you're going to open the Ziploc. You're going to add, I, I don't just say two cups of boiling water. What I like to do with mine is I add enough boiling water until it just gets to the top of the dehydrated product. Whatever it is, it seems to be pretty consistent for me. If you want to be safe, you don't want to mess around, add two cups. I find that it's roughly two cups. So I like, you know, Mountain House is different too. I mean, what, it depends on what consistency you like. Maybe you like your jambalaya a little more soupish. Fine. Point is, I add the water just until it gets to the top of the product. And then with the zipper, you're able to seal it. Um, and again, with, with dehydrating, you're going to find that it takes a little longer than freeze-dried. Mountain House is freeze-dried. It takes 10 to 15 minutes for it to get nice and soft and get it a real nice edible consistency. I found that the dehydrating, I really like to let it go 20 minutes, which is really no big deal because usually I've got a lot of camp chores to do, drying clothes, getting my boots off, um, lots of things. So the first thing I do when I get to camp after a day of hunting or whatever I'm doing is I usually start my meal, get the water in it. The great thing about these Mylar bags is just like, just like the uh, Mountain House, they stay hot for a long time. They can sit there for 30, 45 minutes, no problem. 
even in pretty cool weather. But what I like to do with them, if I've got a fire, I just set these pretty close to the fire. And uh, now not too close because these Mylar bags will burn. But just that warmth of the fire will keeps it nice and warm. Or I'll wrap it in a shirt or put it un kind of under my pack or something just to kind of give it a little insulation factor. I just think it cooks really nice if you, it will cook just fine setting out. But if you can do that added, a little bit of added insulation, it makes a big difference. So once you've got these bags um, and you feel, now here you can see a bag, I'll just show you this. This is a bag with four cups of water in it. You can see that I've got, I do have enough room to probably rehydrate it. I haven't tested the limits of these bags. But I do know that two cups of dehydrated product with the water gives me as much or more than most Mountain House meals, and I've got plenty of room. The other thing I like about these bags is they're a little bit shorter than the Mountain House. I'll give you an example. I've got some Mountain House meals if anybody wants to buy any. So you can see that this bag is just a little shorter um, than, the, than the standard, not much, but just a little shorter than the Mountain House. And so the spoon, the same spoon that you use for Mountain House works just fine for these. You can notice that the Mountain House has a stand-up bottom. I wish they had this size of bag and a stand-up bottom. We're gonna, our bag number two option we're going to talk about in a second, you'll see has one. But the bag size that I wanted for a one-person meal just did not have the stand-up bottom um, that I could find. And these were cheaper. Uh, and they sold these in the quantities of 50. So you can buy these bags, the eight and a half by 8.75 for about 50 cents a piece in quantities of 50. So this is a much more um, tolerable quantity. Um, again, you can write on them with a Sharpie, whatever. So there's vacuum sealed at the top. You've got the backup seal, which is the zipper below. So the process I go through when I do this is I put my dehydrated product in, I put my oxygen absorbing packet in, which I'll talk about in a second. I squeeze the air out of it, okay? Just, just manual. I seam seal, seam seal. I seal it with the sealer. Then I go back and I zip the zipper. The combination of that process makes these virtually bulletproof. You've got your oxygen absorber inside, You've got it seam sealed, you've got your zipper, you're golden. If you notice that, Mount, that um, Mountain House, not that it matters, but their, um, their zipper does not come sealed. Um, so that's the way that works. And again, this is four cups of liquid. You can kind of see what that, um, actually that's not true. This is, this is about three cups of liquid. This is three cups. Um, that's my fault. Three cups of liquid. That's, that's a lot of meal for a single person. Um, here are some samples of some other. Here I got bear chili. I've got jambalaya. I've got pad thai. Um, you know, I'm, in, I'm right in the middle of making a lot of meals for this season. So, so the next bag we're going to talk about is kind of a new option that you might consider, that some of you may not, is I've started doing dehydrated meals for groups. Meaning if a couple guys, two or three guys are going in, or your family, um, I have two kids and my wife, and I can package up a complete meal in one bag for us when we're backcountry camping, whatever. Maybe we got back to camp late and we didn't want to cook, so we just grabbed one of our prepackaged meals we cooked it up, served it, and uh, we were good to go. So what I use for that is this bag. This bag is exactly the same as the first bag, except for two things. It's a bigger, obviously, and it's a little thicker. So this bag is, I'm going to look at my notes, is 9 by 13 by 5. Now five means it's got a stand up bottom. As you can see, this bag is standing up. So this bag has a stand up bottom. I'm gonna kind of show you that. This bag right here has seven cups of water in it. Um, you can see much like the Mountain House. So this bag, 
uh, is nice because it's a little more durable, to be honest. It's a little thicker. It's got a nice stand-up bottom. And I'll tell you another feature that's nice for. Um, and it will hold, I think it will hold eight, I think it will hold seven to eight cups with room to re rehydrate. Um, I recently took my staff on a trip, uh, my staff from Missouri, um, and um, we took them on a backcountry trip in Yellowstone. I think there was eight of us. And I made two of these containers of um, bear chili. And when we re rehydrated these, we put the hot water in, set them by the fire, gave them 20 minutes. They were fantastic. But what I did was... You know, like any backcountry, you really, I like to keep my cleanup to the ultimate low. So what we did was I just cut off the top of this bag and turned this into a serving bowl. We had a large spoon. Everybody got a cup. And we just ate bear chili out of a cup. It was great. And eight people could not eat two of these, um, two of these bags of the bear chili. And, you know, it's just great packing it in. It was just so lightweight. Even though I have llamas, I still want to go in lightweight, come out lightweight, because I want to leave room for the elk meat and the adult beverages or whatever else we're taking. I just like the ease of the preparation. I don't want the cleanup when I'm on those trips. And now I have two options. One, a single meal option, which we just talked about. And now this new bag that I started using this past year, which allows me to do a four meal option. So those are the two bags. These bags, unfortunately, come in 250 quantity lots, but they are about 37 cents each. So when you really do the math, even if you don't need 250, it's still a deal for four meals in one bag. Uh, and again, I really like these. I really like these these bags. Again, AdsorbanceSystems.com, and in the description, I'll be posting up the links and the model, uh, the item numbers, in case the links will change. So, as far as one of the last things I kind of want to talk about today was the oxygen absorbers. I also buy those from Zorbance Systems. And they come, the ones I buy, come in lots of 50. Um, it's hard to believe there's actually 50 in this bag, but there is. So there's 50 in this bag. I use the 200 cc packets. I kind of did some math, and then, and then I kind of overkilled it. You can buy ox absorbers in like, I don't know, ways 10, 20 cc's all the way up to whatever. And what that basically is for is the size of the auction packet basically is the size of the packaging and what you're packaging in it. So I found that the 200cc works really, really good for both of these packets. Um, and I haven't had any trouble with these. So I buy these in 50s. One of the problems with oxygen absorbers is they absorb oxygen. So once you open this packet, you want to have a storage me um, vessel for those. I use just a small mason jar. This mason jar holds holds 50 really easy. So I, I just use, once this one's done, I just fill it back up with this. Um, so that's how I do that. Um, so I buy the oxygen absorbers, I buy the bags, and then I also use, sometimes, I'll show one more thing I use, is dehydrator screens. Um, I have a love-hate relationship with these. Um, these are primarily used for fruit so you can lay these on top of the trays in there and you can put fruit on top of them. They do work really nice. Um, they tend to stick a little bit, but it's very good for small, um, when you're dehydrating small items. So I buy this dehydrator screen uh, in a rolls. I buy all of my meat processing equipment and I buy these dehydrator screens from a company called LEM. Um, and I, I believe it's just LEM products. Yeah, LEMproducts.com. Um, great quality stuff. When you're looking at grinders, stuffers, any kind of meat preparation equipment, I, you know, it's reasonably priced, good quality. I've had the same grinder I've had. Man, I, I think that grinder, my grinder's almost 18 years old. 
So very good quality. I really like the company. So they have several products, but these dehydrator screens do work well uh, for some applications as well. So that about covers how I do the back card meal prep. Um, in future videos, we'll talk about actually some, some preps, meal preps, meal, out, meal ideas, um, maybe some tips on what works good, what doesn't work good. But for this one, I want to stay focused on the components. So those of you that are thinking about getting into dehydrating your own, or those that are and are looking for some other solutions like the packaging, I hope this helped. And I've got a lot more coming. I hope you subscribe to my channel. And um, my website, I post a lot of um, articles on our website at treelinepursuits.com. Make sure you follow us on Instagram at treeline underscore pursuits. Have a great season and um, check back with us soon.